Welcome to a special episode of Character Creation Cast, everyone. We went to a catacon a couple weeks ago and recorded a recap on the way home while everything was relatively fresh on our minds. What this means is that we recorded this in the car. So I'm sorry to everyone, but the audio quality of this episode is much worse than our normal standards. But we tried to reduce the road noise as much as possible without turning us into robots speaking to you underwater. It was really, really bad. We just wanted to give you the authentic experience of riding with us on the way home. Or something like that. Yeah, we'll go with that. Amelia had a pretty packed weekend, so she can't be here to spread the word. But she's in the process of starting a new podcast called Garbage of the Five Rings. And I'm sure anybody familiar with the show will be familiar with how much Amelia loves The Legend of the Five Rings. So, uh, pretty excited to uh, listen to that. Uh, We'll have a link in the show notes to their Twitter account. And I'll let her tell you all about it next time. Uh, Which reminds me, I still need to start Shadow of the Cabal. So, note to future Amelia, remind future Ryan to start listening to Shadow of the Cabal. One last announcement... We could still use your reviews. We have two new ones in the pipeline, and we'll get to those as soon as both of us can record together again. But if you are able to and haven't yet, head on over to the show notes and find our links to our iTunes, Stitcher, and Facebook pages where you can leave reviews. We absolutely love to read them. And since we're short-staffed for this opener, we'll just leave the announcements at that for now. Enjoy our recap of A Catacon 2018, and join us again on Thursday for another bonus character creation spotlight episode. Enjoy the show. special episode of character creation cast everyone uh amelia and i are on the road uh we're on the way home from a catacon we're in a car together in yeah. person this is uh really strange recording in the back of the car as my wife drives um <laughs> oh i want people to think that we're driving while we're recording this oh yeah i mean yeah i'm super cool we are totally driving while recording this and we're not even looking at the road we're looking at our waveforms that's right. how good we are yep yeah. <laughs> uh, all those things that we predicted in our last episode came true, obviously. It had to have. I mean... <laughs> I mean, it was, it was just so fantastic. Those twins reuniting. Yeah. I, uh, Cthulhu monsters. I don't even remember what we said. I'm not going to lie. I, 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 don't, I, don't, I have no idea. We made some bold predictions. <laughs> we really I'm sure did. they were true. I'm, I'm sure it happened. <laughs> A catacomb was so packed full of everything, it, it had to have There's happened There's no somewhere. way that that wasn't one of the things. Exactly. Yeah. So we're here to uh, basically talk about how a catacomb went. Yep, we're going to do a quick recap of our schedules and talk about our favorite things, maybe least favorite things if we feel like it. I don't, I don't know if I could identify a least favorite thing because almost everything was my favorite thing. Uh, my least favorite thing was sleeping on a really crummy hotel, like, cot thing. Ooh. Yeah. That's no fun. But I was not the one that had to sleep on the floor, and that's what's important. That's not too bad. Yeah. Yeah, no, we, we had a, a really good experience with the bed. It was, uh, it, it felt not as good as we thought it was going to be. But once we fell asleep, we just were out. Yeah. I, got to, I did get to sleep in the bed for two nights. Yeah. And then I slept on the cot thing for two nights. The beds were not bad. Not yeah. as good as, you know, nothing's ever as good as your bed at home. Yeah, it wasn't too bad. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that's our that's our bed review of the Crown Plaza Hotel in Dayton, Ohio. Uh huh. Yeah, not too bad. Their gym was really nice. Oh, I used was it? the gym? Yeah, it was. Um, they had like all kinds of like equipment, everything, everything I needed to do all my yeah. physical therapy stuff. I you know the broadswords were working out in the gym. Yep, yep. I ran into them uh, yesterday morning, and we talked a little bit before a few of them worked out. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that was nice. Yeah. And yeah, the gym looked really nice. So. Uh, if you are going to be going to a catacomb next year, uh, don't forget to check it out. 
I don't know why we're plugging this, but... <laughs> it's the hotel that's, like, attached to the convention center, so, like, stay there so you don't have to go outside, because it was cold outside. Oh, yeah, yeah, Well, cold, quote-unquote. I mean, I yesterday mean, was pretty windy. It, it, okay, without the wind, it was fine, but with the wind, yeah. That's such a Midwestern thing to say. Like, it'd be fine, except for the wind. It's true. Yeah, that's that's pretty much uh, the whole thing. Once, once you were, like, between certain buildings and... The wind started picking up. It was like, ee, why am I out here? Right. But uh, the convention was inside, so... Yeah, and you could take a skywalk uh, from the hotel right to the convention center. If you listened to my uh, All Out of Bubblegum episode on the International Podcast Month uh, I Am Here feed, uh, you would have heard about that. All right, so uh, how about we go through what we did? Yeah, our actual convention schedule. Yeah. So, Friday morning, I played my favorite convention game, uh, Descent into Midnight. Nice. I played twice at Gen Con, and I played it again at a Catacon, and it was still amazing. Nice. What did you play? Um, what did I play this time? The Orator playbook. The Orator. Um, and I played as a piece of obsidian rock. Nice. Yeah, it was very fun. That's very cool. Um, this time, the corruption was a giant black void that was uh, sucking up memories in an effort to become sentient itself. Oh, very cool. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. So I played that one with um, my friend Devin and my friend Jude. And who else was in that game? I feel like there were a couple other people. Was that run by Taylor or Richard? Um, that one was run by Richard. Okay. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah, I was, I was really excited to play that one again because I had such a great time with it at Gen Con. Yeah. And I played it the two times there. Um, I really wanted to get in a game with Taylor because uh, Richard and Rich run it very differently. Oh, yeah. And so I wanted the experience of Taylor running it too. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately, my schedule just didn't work out. But it was so much fun. It's still such a great game. Mm-hmm. Like, underwater fish horror is amazing. It really is, yeah. Um, I had two sessions of Descent into Midnight this time around. Uh, the first one was with Taylor, mm-hmm. and it was amazing. Um, uh, and actually, my wife actually had joined us for that one, and this was her first, like, real-time diving into actual role-playing. Okay. Uh, so it was interesting. Uh, she had played uh, the sentient coral reef Ooh. that we lived inside. Nice. It was pretty sweet. That's and awesome. What did I play? Was, oh, I was like this, like, amorphous mass... That had, like, all sorts of octopus tentacles coming out of it. Cool. I don't remember what it did, but I don't know. Yeah. What was the corruption in that game? I can't even remember. I know in our game, Devin played this, like, gloopy blob thing that, like, Mm -hmm. parts of it kept, like, blobbing off, like, in a lava lamp, Mm -hmm. you know? Um, and we eventually decided that it was because they were from higher up in the ocean. The pressure down here, just, like, they couldn't keep themselves together. Oh, yeah. But... It would, like, suck up things into, uh, their, into their gloop. I remember now. It was, um, there was these little, like, microscopic uh, organisms mm-hmm. that lived near the surface of the water. And the sunlight would power them up uh, with, with nutrients. And then they would float down. And they would attach themselves to the, the civilization and feed them nutrients. So it would feed us nutrients. And then we would give them our waste, Mm -hmm. and then they would float back up to the surface, and then the sun would probably take care of the waste. And so there was, like, this symbiotic relationship with these microorganisms. Yeah. Um, And then the... There was... The corruption was, like, these cold brine ice finger things. Ooh. uh, Where, like... If you've ever seen it, talked about on the Descent into Midnight feed or anything like that... Uh, there is uh, this phenomena in the ocean, and this is real, where the water is so cold that at some point, like a little particulate or something gets in the way and starts a chain reaction of crystallization. Ooh. And it forms these, like, uh, what look like growing fingers that grow down to the bottom of the ocean. And as soon as they touch the ground, it flash freezes anything that it touches. Oh, that's so crazy. Yeah, it's totally wild. The ocean is nuts, dude. And there's so much that we don't know about it that's, like, terrifying. That's very true. Um, so that was that was the first Descent into Midnight game. Um, 
And the second one, it was just uh, myself and Amaraz, who's uh, mm -hmm. a big uh, proponent of our Discord server. And yeah, big one shot fan. Yeah. Um, and we played uh, a two player variant uh, of the game with uh, Richard at the helm. Oh, yeah. Um, so uh, Amaraz played a sword shark. Uh, or with like a saw nose or something like that. Cool. And I played um, the organic, the collective organic matter beneath the surface uh, or beneath the, the bottom of the ocean mm -hmm. that lived underneath the hydrothermic vents and I was able to move my consciousness through the organic matter that comes out of the hydrothermic vents. Oh, that's so cool. And I was able to like flow through um, the city that we had created, which was just bonkers. So ours, we had these giant crab things. So, okay, back up. One of my favorite things to do in role-playing games is to, like, sort of determine what the mood of the setting is based on colors. Yeah. Like, that's a thing that you see in a lot of movies and things like that. Um, we had... Devin at our table who is also an, a fantastic artist mm -hmm. um, and so I know that she feels the same way I do and so I asked her I said, what are the color tones of this game and she said dark blue dark purple and a neon pink Ooh. so we decided we were very deep under the ocean um, and the whole city was lit by these like bioluminescent little tiny like worm larva things um, and the entire city is like these white pearlescent stone um, but the stone actually comes from these giant crabs that are, like, building the city. And these little pink larva things are their babies. Oh, wow. So our job as the Guardians is to, like, protect mm -hmm. these little wormy things. That makes sense. Um, and then when the crabs die, their shells become part of the city. Oh, nice. Um, but their souls are still in there, so each, like, neighborhood that is made out of one of these shells has a very different feel to oh, it. Oh, nice. Um, and then we, there were also some of these shells like kind of floating up above us that we called the moons. There were yeah. 10 moons. Um, and one of them had gone dark. Wow. Yeah. It was so cool. Like we, we built so much like lore about like yeah. how we had these like big festivals around when these like larva built their chrysalisks to like become these crab things. Mm -hmm. And like it was, it was just so awesome. And we did all of this in like three hours. Wow. Yeah. You know, this game is bonkers in the best way possible. Yeah, like, and I've played it three times now, and every time has been so vastly different uh -huh. and so amazing. Yeah, and uh, just hearing your examples and comparing them to my examples, there's there's ver virtually nothing similar between the games, and being able to create that unique world right away uh, as part of character creation yeah. is just such a remarkable uh, experience. So if, if you ever have the chance to play this game at a convention or a playtest or uh, whatnot, and I think they actually have a free public beta test? They have a playtest document up on their website yeah. um, that you can go to. I know they uh, Taylor said they're going to be making some changes after Catacon again to like yeah. some of the feedback that they got. Um, Re, Re was the other one in my game. I couldn't oh, remember. Yeah. I was like, it was somebody else that I knew. I'm sorry, Re. Yep. <laughs> um, yeah, it was, gosh, it was so much fun. It was, it was just amazing. Like, yeah. pick up this game. It's Powered by the Apocalypse. Yeah. Um, so very easy to pick up and play and run. Um, all the playbooks are there. They're all fantastic. I've played three different ones now, and they're mm -hmm. all just awesome. Very cool. Yeah. yeah. I, I played two different playbooks the first time. Uh, this weekend, I was stuck with the same playbook I played last year. Uh-huh. But I think that was perfectly good experience because then I was able to compare what last year's felt like to this year's and, and things were definitely a lot more polished yeah. this year, which was great. Yeah. They put a lot of work into it. I know even since Gen Con when I play it too. So. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, Descend into Midnight. Check it out. It's awesome. Mm -hmm. Um, And that was my second game, the first Descent into Midnight game, mm -hmm. the second game on Friday. My first game on Friday was actually uh, Senda's Love and Justice run by Andy Fox. Yes. Uh, from She's a Super Geek and Redemption and uh, Wednesday Evening Podcast All-Stars. Mm -hmm. um, and that was just a really fantastic experience. That game, uh, you play as magical girls. That's your brand. Yeah. It, and 
really all you have to do is it's a three page RPG it has um, everything you need to know how to play the game in it and it's free on drive through RPG so you can just go and download it oh. yeah it's really cool um, but basically you create your group of magical girls you you pick your theme you uh, go through and figure out what archetype you are of the magical girl genre, mm-hmm. and then once you get to a certain point in the story, you do your transformation sequence, and then you defeat the bad guy. Nice. Yeah. So it was, it was really fun, and um, I believe I played the genius, um, and I was uh, able to like hit my glasses and, and pull up some. Uh, sapphire blue shades that had like a- analytical data about the scene wow. on it which was really cool and this is all like stuff that you make up like yeah it doesn't have specific crunchy rules for anything like this because it's based on the um lasers lasers and feelings lasers and feelings yeah mm-hmm. uh so it's you you select a stat uh a number between two and five And if you have a higher number, that means you are better at love. Uh So you have to roll underneath your number when you're doing things that involve love or friendship. Um, And if you have a lower number, uh, closer to two, that means you're better at justice. So if you're doing fighty things, um, you'll be rolling above that number. Um, And then if you roll equal to the number you unlock a special question that you can ask. Oh, okay. So you ask a question and then you can say how you want to do it differently mm-hmm. and then you can re-roll and use the that result if you wanted to. Oh, nice. So it's really sweet. Um, and then the number of successes that you get depends on uh, how many you dice you roll and then you have to roll extra dice depending on if your uh, archetype applies or if your powers apply. Okay. Uh, so it's a pretty simple system, uh, but it was a blast. I had so much fun with that. That sounds awesome. Yeah. And Andy would be like, I imagine, super good at running that too. Oh like, my gosh, she was amazing. <laughs> she's so like, um, I, like, I feel like boisterous is a good word for her. She's just mm-hmm. like, she is a presence Yeah. when you are in the room with uh-huh. her. Like, you're like, oh. There she is. <laughs> yeah, she is, she is so good at what she does. Um, and, and all those games that, that they play over on She's a Super Geek, um, I, I imagine it, it just uh, creates this, this wonderful diversity of uh, ability with the role playing that, uh, that it's hard to match. Yeah, yeah definitely. So it was fantastic. That sounds awesome. Mm-hmm. What'd you do Friday, like? later afternoon, evening. Oh, goodness. Uh, my first Chimera play test. Nice. Yes. Oh, my goodness. Okay, so, uh, I had signed myself up to run one official game of Chimera. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, this was the one that anybody could have signed up for. And I had, I, I believe Steph was there. Yes. Um, and... Aaron. Aaron. And, uh, Emily... Okay. Uh, the one of the creators of uh, Domina Magica. Yes. Um, and uh, Dan uh, Chogler. Uh, he's a, he's a good friend of the Block Party Podcast Network. Okay. Um, and I made good friends with him uh, last year because he play tested the pre alpha version of Chimera. Oh, okay. Which, so you got to see what it looks like now. Uh huh. And oh, okay, so the pre alpha version of Chimera absolute garbage. Okay. Well, uh, you know, you gotta start somewhere. It's true. The The concepts of blending genres and blending playbooks was went over perfectly fine last year, um, but this year it has become refined into something absolutely just mind-blowing. It, it exceeded my expectations completely. Um, so, did everybody get to, like, did you pick a base genre and then everybody kind of filled in from there or did you have you okay i so the game is set up right now where i have three genres that i have worked on already okay i've got the fantasy genre Mm -hmm. superhero genre Mm -hmm. and magical girl genre okay you get to pick two or three of them to blend together 
How did those blend together? Because I feel like fantasy superhero is Magical Girl. Kinda. You would think so. But here's you here, would think that you would think you? that wouldn't you? <laughs> um, so the actual mechanics of how to build your characters is you have to build the world first. Okay. Each genre world has a list of six tropes. Okay. And if you select two genres, you get to select six tropes between, between the, the two, two genres. Okay. If you have three genres, you get an extra two to select. Okay. So uh, it's things like the fantasy world has um, monsters roam the world okay. is one of the tropes. And if you select that, now if you go to the countryside, there's going to be random monsters everywhere or okay. things like that. So by selecting that playbook, you've already started to well, that's, implement that's just things a, into the world. That's just a trope, yeah. That's just okay. a trope of one of the worlds. This is part of the world building portion of character creation. So once you build your world with the tropes that you select, um, then you go and start picking your characters. Um, I currently have six playbooks per genre. Okay. And each playbook has a primary page and a secondary page. Okay. okay. Once a playbook is selected, nobody else can use the other page that you're not going to be using. Okay. So if I chose the paladin, uh -huh. say, from the fantasy genre, I want to be a paladin primary, yeah. and maybe I want to be a mutant from the superhero genre as my secondary. Okay. Now, nobody else can choose paladin or mutant as their other half. Okay. So, basically, you select two playbooks, and you fuse them together. You fuse one primary playbook and one secondary playbook okay. together, and that creates one unified playbook. Um, that went over amazingly well. I heard nothing but good things from the people that played the game. Um, yeah. I'm pretty good friends with Steph and Aaron, and they both mm -hmm. loved it. Like, they both kept talking over the course of the weekend. They were, like, they were really surprised at how well it, it worked. Yeah. So. Uh, I, I was kind of surprised, too, because... <laughs> I, I, mean, I feel bad. Like, I feel... That feels like a weird thing to say, to be like, they were surprised that it went well. And, like, not right. like that, but they were, you know... I mean, it's, it's an interesting concept and anytime you play a game for yep. the first time you're like I don't know how I feel about this yeah and I know um, I know Aaron even commented on our forums he said that um, I wasn't sure how this was going to play yeah but once I played it it was fantastic yeah and it's it's and Aaron is, like, a huge fan of masks. He runs a lot of masks and yeah. does, like, a lot of PBTA stuff, too. So, um, mm -hmm. I know that he, he was really excited to see how, how those things fit together. Because in those ones, you pick one playbook, and that's your thing. So, yep, yep. Um, yeah. Yeah, so it was pretty sweet. Um, so I ran three games of Chimera this whole weekend. So there was one on Friday uh -huh. and two on Saturday. Uh, the first one on Friday, uh, we played superheroes combined with magical girls. Okay. Well, we didn't have the fantasy genre included. Um, what was that one? Oh, yes, I remember now. Okay, so they had the... Uh, they were all some sort of magical girl. Okay. One of them... Uh, every single one of them had either a secondary a prime, or a primary magical girl playbook. Mm-hmm. And I believe Emily was a Magical Girl playbook fused with another Magical Girl playbook. That checks out. Yep. Uh, so we had every single, all six Magical Girl playbooks were accounted for in the first game, which okay. I was I'm sure amazing. you were, like, so excited about I was about like, that. yes, please, <laughs> I am here for this. Um, so they had to, uh, they were in a, I think it was like a modern society Okay. With kingdoms, because they had mon no, they didn't have the monsters roaming the world. They were in a modern society. Oh, it was a monarchy. Oh, okay. Ruled the world. It was a queen that ruled everything, and there was a an evil force that was trying to uh, invade this reality and dethrone the queen so that he could rule. Yeah. Okay. One of the characters. Um, I believe it was uh, Richard's character. Richard Crace Landry, I believe, was another player in the game. Oh. Uh, he was a an alien combined with a magical girl. And his alien that he created was an alien from an alternate reality 
that had become destroyed and turned into a shadow world. And so he doesn't have much remembrance of his previous reality. Oh. And uh, he wanted to get back so he could be home again. Cool. And uh, it ultimately played out that um, the nature's daughters, as they called themselves, because mm-hmm. uh, they had a very nature-themed everything. Yeah. Um, they had stopped him finally using their ultimate attack um, where everybody combined powers. Through the power of friendship. Through the power of friendship. That's exactly the move name. Of course it is. It is. <laughs> um, Even I know that. Exactly. <laughs> and they, they stopped him and um, they found out that he just wanted to go home too. Aww. To the alternate reality. And the only way to do that was to fuse the alternate reality with the current reality. So that's what he was ultimately trying to do. Um, so that went over really well. Cool. And Saturday I played with the, the crew from the Block Party Podcast Network. Okay. Um, as well as Danny Neary. Oh, yeah. Um, and uh, I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with Danny Neary. Uh, she is... Uh, She's another person that is a presence. She is a presence in the best way possible. Yes, I love her. Uh-huh. I um, terrible RPG with her last year, and it was fantastic. Oh, she played this, like... Oh, my God. Um, kind of like this, like... 80s like hair metal groupie yeah like it was it was so good that's it was awesome so good. oh my goodness yeah she played a rogue uh combined with uh, i believe a magical girl and uh they're the rest of the party were different blends they they blended all three genres in this game oh cool so this was a fantasy superhero magical girl blend and it was a uh 1920s aesthetic with future technology in walled cities because monsters were roaming the world like crazy. And the people, it wasn't just walled cities, it was a, uh, every city was in a force field dome. Oh. And where nobody was allowed to escape because it was super dangerous on the outside. What so, horrible dystopia is this? Right. So it was these cities where the, uh, the people were treated well by the government like very well the government's main purpose was to keep everybody happy yeah so it was like this this weird orwellian sort of society where everybody couldn't leave but they didn't care it it was kind of like the truman show in a way did you ever read the giver no oh okay feels like that okay so Everybody's stuck in the city, and the evil person, or the evil force... What was that? We watched the giver. We did? Yeah, we watched the movie of it in the hospital. Oh. After I gave birth to it. Oh. I don't know if I've ever seen the movie of it. I don't know either. I mean, I, I don't remember it. Apparently, we watched The Giver. Oh, okay, but so that's the one that had a Jeff Bridges in it. Oh, yeah, oh, with the lo- right. with the lack of color. Yeah. Yeah, and then they were trying to discover. Okay, yeah, yeah, they were trying to discover color back, or people were starting to discover color, and yeah, there's like this kid Jonas, and he like is getting the collective memories of the. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I remember that movie now. Yeah, that was pretty good. Uh huh. Okay. Okay. Okay, yeah. I get it. We're on the same page now. All right. <laughs> um, so they had to prevent. Uh, you know, these attacks on the shield generators, basically. Oh, okay. Uh, and they were... Not uh, the shield generators? Uh, not the shield generators. Um, so they f- were at their favorite cafe, and they heard an explosion. Oh, boy. Okay. No, they weren't at a cafe. They were at a Chinese shop, a uh, Chinese food place. Oh. Um, and so they heard an explosion outside. They went and checked it out. It was an old factory or something like that that was still in operation. And they went there to see what the explosion was about. But uh, Danny, uh, as a rogue, and uh, Mitch Conley uh, from the Dungeon Master's block played an alien robot that was just a brain, like, in a robot suit. Okay. And he's been here for, like, hundreds of years. Mm-hmm. And he had no idea what interactions with people were like. 
Oh. So he trusted Danny to figure out how to act. Oh. Which, Don't trust Danny. Which is a disaster once Danny is a rogue that is yeah. hell-bent on uh, stealing things. Yeah. So when the rest of the group was trying to fix the situation, Danny was like, all right, time to loot. Oh, gosh. <laughs> yep, of course she was. <laughs> so they found uh, some radioactive materials because that was what Danny was looking for. Mm-hmm. And tried to get to the containment uh, units so they could steal little bits of it. And Danny accidentally overloaded the containment unit for all this radioactive material and nearly uh, created a nuclear explosion that they then had to prevent. So their heroics was preventing the thing that they were accidentally triggering. Way to go, guys. It was fantastic. That was such a good game. And then the last playtest of Chimera Saturday afternoon was with uh, Kristen, Bianca uh, from the Broadswords, uh, Chris Berlu, uh, and Andy Fox from Redemption, and um, and Angela Kraft from Fandible. Mm-hmm. So they played a superhero with a magical girl mix, and um, gosh, what was this one all about? It was fantastic, though. Oh, yeah. They they played um, in a, like, modern-ish society with, like, slight future tech. There was, like, uh, some advanced biotechnology. Yeah. And But the world was run by mega corporations. Of course. So it had this, like, very cyberpunk sort of feel to it. I'm down for that. And... Uh, their main enemy was the CEO of a mega corporation, um, and it, what was her name? Doctor, it was Doctor Clock. Okay. Was her name? And oh, and it was steampunk, cyberpunk, uh, like aesthetic to everything. So like a lot of the inner workings of all of the computers and stuff was like little clockwork stuff. Because I, have weird I don't, I don't do. love steampunk as a genre, but lots of people do. That's yeah, fine. Yeah, yeah. Live your dream. And it steampunk as a traditional genre, it has a lot of very like colonialism. Yeah. Uh, oh yeah. I mean, if you're just like it, specifically talking about the tech and stuff. Like yeah. That's, yeah. So it was basically just the tech of steampunk, uh, the mega corporations of cyberpunk. Rising up against them effectively as well. With also superheroes and magical girls. Superheroes and magical girls, yeah. That's a lot of genres. Oh, it was fantastic. Um, Andy played a creation magical girl. Okay. Uh, a creation is like a, an android or a biotech or something like that. Somebody yeah. somebody created you yes. um, for a purpose. Okay. Turns out the evil Dr. Clock created uh, Andy's character um, and she was a Frankenstein monster who when she transformed into a magical girl looked like a normal uh, Japanese schoolgirl. Oh. Yeah. So oh. She, like all her stitches, all her stitched up body parts, all the stitches went away. Oh my gosh, that's so complicated. I know. So it was like a reverse transformation sequence. Wow. And uh, so ew, it was just fantastic. So they her, they were doing karaoke because Kristen played the heart, which was a, it, it's a playbook uh, uh, for the magical girl genre based upon uh, being famous. Mm-hmm. Uh, so she was like a mildly famous singer. Okay. And uh, it's a playbook of being completely full of yourself. Yeah. And Kristen played it perfectly. It, it was basically... <laughs> that, Kristen? No. <laughs> yeah, no. Uh, it was basically Eulares as a magical girl. Okay. And it was phenomenal. Um, and basically they had to stop Dr. Clock from unveiling this uh, technology that she was giving away for free, which is not like her. And they were going to unveil it at the hospital because it was supposed to be something that will help get rid of disease in Mm. people. And so they went and interrupted it. They found out that there was nothing underneath the box. So there's nothing that was being unveiled. It was was just a trap. 
A trap. It was a trap. It's a trap. And uh, they had to fight all of these, like, uh, pieced together monstrosities. And apparently uh, they just used this uh, amazing attack to freeze everybody. And they took out Dr. Clock with their power of friendship. Of course. Which... I gotta say, is one of my favorite things so far about the the genre stuff is every genre has two special moves that it adds to the game. Yeah. And anybody can use those moves. Mm -hmm. But this power of friendship move is just fantastic. Because the leader says, all right, let's join up. Let's take this villain out. And it just dominates. And then they build their Megazord. And then, no. Just you could. You could. Um, so yeah. I grew up on Power Rangers, so... Yeah, that's true. There's a, there's a lot of different ways you can interpret it. The, the beauty of Powered by the Apocalypse and the way that I'm, I'm creating this game is all of the abilities are open to interpretation. Yeah. Just like Descent into Midnight. Yeah, just like any of those, like, you can really... Yeah. And... them any way you want to. And I told, uh, Taylor and Richard this already, but, uh... Chimera has a lot of influence from Descent into Midnight in yeah. terms of how it plays. Um, so if you like Descent into Midnight, uh, keep an eye out for Chimera because it's going to be uh, taking the world by storm in 2019. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I talked a lot about Chimera. You did? I apologize. But I, I played a lot of Chimera. Okay, I ran a lot of Chimera. I didn't play a single lick of it because I don't have anything written for the GM yet. Oh, you'll get there. I'll get there. And then I can finally play it someday. Yeah. Um, Friday afternoon. Yeah. I did nothing. Oh? Yeah, I hung out. I nice. had some lunch. Just I wish chilled. I could have done that. Yeah. Um, it was okay. I Just like the way my scheduling worked, it just I didn't have anything else Friday. Yeah. Like after I did my Descent into Midnight game, that was done at like noon. Or one. Mm-hmm. I had nothing else for the rest of the day. Oh, yeah. Um, Friday night, we ended up playing a pickup game of kind of L5R. Oh. Um, Tanner ran us through a quick one-sheet adventure that he had written. Nice. Um, he has a couple up on his website that are they're system agnostic. Okay. Um, just sort of like L5R flavored adventures. Um, and this one, I think, was called The Price of Tears. But he just gave us like we did like a pbta style l5r where basically he gave us like plus two plus one zero minus one whatever and we assigned them to our rings Mm -hmm. um in the new edition of l5r how you go about doing something determines what ring you roll off of oh okay so if you want to take a like very practical learned approach to something you roll with your earth ring if you are trying to be particularly tricky or deceptive mm-hmm. you roll with your air ring oh. um that kind of thing and That's so interesting. yeah yeah um so we just attached the those stats to rings and then we would like kind of explain what we wanted to do and that would determine what we would roll nice. um and add to our 2d6s i like that um but yeah we just ran through this quick adventure i played with um with devin george um devin's friend jess i'm sorry jess i don't know your last name or if you <laughs> want people to know your last name um, and then with um, Steph and Aaron, who oh, nice. had not played L5R before. Nice. Um, so that was a lot of fun. I know Aaron was kind of sort of familiar with the world a little bit. Um, yeah. But I don't think Steph knew all that much about it. Oh, okay. Um, but we had a lot of fun. We had a lot of fun yeah. um, playing around with that game, and it was just... We were, like, a little bit silly, but it was, it was a cool introduction for new people into the setting. Um, and... We did that for like a couple hours, just while other people were hanging out and oh, cool. playing. We were like hiding in the back corner of oh. the convention hall, and well, there just you go. Like our quick pickup game. I cool. also worked out. That was when I went to the gym. Mm. Yeah. Oh, very cool. Well, yeah. that sounds fun. It was. It was a lot of fun. Nice. Um, Saturday morning. Yeah. Oh. We had our panel. Yeah, we did. We learned so much about Dirge Stranglethorn. Dirge Stranglethorn. Yes. If you missed the panel, I believe James has the audio. Yeah, he recorded it, so Um, hopefully that'll come out at some point. I would imagine he'll probably either release that right onto the one-shot feed or onto the Patreon feed. We don't know. Yeah, my guess is it'll come out on the Secret Archive. That's usually where most of that stuff comes out. Yeah, most likely. 
but before that, Friday, I had the Broad Swords panel. Oh my god, you have more stuff Friday? I do! I was packed all day. I apologize. So I had the Broad Swords panel uh -huh. on Friday, which was amazing. The Broad Swords played um, their characters yes. in a modern world. Yes. And that was just amazing. Um, it, was, it was hilarious, and they were all in college. And uh, they were all their normal personalities, and, and I believe that they just released the audio for that on their feed? Um, it's or, not or been it released. It'll be on the One Shot Patreon. Um, it's, I know that I saw Victoria sent it to James this morning, mm -hmm. so my guess is it'll come out in the next couple weeks. Yeah. So it'll be available at some point, um, and it's going to be uh, something awesome to listen to. It was, it was really fantastic hearing that in person. Yeah. Um, and then after that, my last thing on Friday was the Geek Wars Live panel. Mm -hmm. um, I was a judge, uh, and my wife was uh, there to participate, um, as well as on one of the teams. And it went over really well. Um, the, the rounds were pretty... Uh, pretty similar to last year uh, and got a lot of good geek trivia in and, and everybody had a lot of fun. Nice. So yeah, it was great. Um, saw some things that I can't unsee but that's okay. Uh, there's some of the uh, the uh, special rounds between each round mm -hmm. where you have to do stuff as a team. Yeah. And some of them are performances. Oh, okay. Uh, so it was fun. Cool. Yeah. I really enjoyed it. Um, so if you have a chance next year uh, at a Catacon, check out the Geek Wars Live too, because it's it's just a fun thing to do, uh, even if you don't know much about geek trivia. Yeah. So, yeah, that was that was the end of my Friday. Okay. Right. Okay. We have we have reached now? we have reached the end of my super packed like two hours of free time Friday. Okay, this is a 42, we're at like 42 minutes of recording, we've just finished Friday. It's true. Well, okay, Friday was my most packed thing, and we already went over... All two, of your... Per, uh, like, yeah. pretty much the first half of my Saturday okay. already. Okay, alright. Okay, did you do anything else Saturday? Friday? Friday? No. No, not Friday, Saturday. We're on Saturday now. Well, no, but we haven't even finished talking about our panel yet, because you oh, cut me true. off because you weren't done with Friday. I apologize. Okay, back to our panel. Yes, our panel... So, uh, our panel was Saturday morning. We yeah. were with James D'Amato. Yes. Um, we went through some exercises from his book, The Ultimate Character RPG Back Ultimate RPG Character Backstory Guide. Yes. Uh, our panel with published author TV's James D'Amato, <laughs> <laughs> as his name tag said all weekend. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> um, so we ran through some exercises. He kind of moderated us through that. Yeah. Um, had us pick characters. We learned so much about Dirge Stranglethorn. We really did. Um, including uh, that his his family was eaten by dinosaurs. His his second family. His second family. Well, because they were uh, these dinosaurs were bred. Yep. By the woman that he left at the altar. Dirge wasn't ready back then. He can't be tied down. He's got too much murdering and stealing to do. Yes. Who's gonna Who's gonna deal with that as he's uh, murdering and stealing? You know who's gonna deal with that? Crescendo restriction bush. <laughs> crescendo restriction bush. Mind you, Crescendo's last name was hyphenated because he had a family. Yes. And Dirge's biggest regret was not having a family, and so Dirge he loves the killing, he loves the stealing. And he He's loves a little bit things. naughty. He's a little bit naughty too. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't want to like say too much more about that panel because hopefully people have a chance to listen to it. And also, like, I yeah. can't remember. It was just. It was hilarious. It was so much fun. It was a lot of fun. Like, I laughed yeah. so hard. It yeah. was a good time. It was a good time. Um, Dirt. Yeah, I'm really glad we got to do that. We got to. Uh, <laughs> we got to spend a lot of time talking about my nightmare horse. Uh huh. Nightmare horse with nightmares. Uh -huh. Arthur. Yep. Poor um, Arthur. Poor Arthur. So, yeah, that was a really good time. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, exactly. So what did you have after the, the panel then? Um, I was actually open from 10 to 2. Okay. Um, so we ended up just playing a pickup game of Mysterium, which yeah. is one of my favorite. It's not a board game, but... It's kind of a board game. Yeah, it's kind it's, of. It's like a mix between board game and role-playing game and, yeah. and like, detective 
game. Yeah, I think it's like it's like the RPG clue kind of. Effectively, yeah. Yeah. Um, and yeah, we when I was doing my playtest of Chimera, uh, I think the last one I saw you uh, over there. Yeah. Uh, um, playing. Yeah, so I played with people who hadn't played before, so we just did it on the easy mode. Nice. Um, but it was a lot of fun. I played as the I was the ghost. Yep. Um, it's that game is so interesting because you're handing people like these sort of abstract art kind of images Mm -hmm. and trying to get them to match them up with clues um, in these like pictures of people and rooms and weapons and it's so interesting to listen to the other people talk it out and try and figure out like why you picked the things that you did Mm -hmm. Um, and they're they're never correct about like why you I mean sometimes they still come to the right conclusion but like they're almost never correct on like what your line of thinking (laughs) was and so to play with people that you don't know that well or you haven't played this game with before it's yeah. always really fun just kind of guessing yeah. yeah yeah it's fun to watch them like kind of be like uh I don't mm-hmm. know yeah so we did that for a couple hours until 2 o'clock when I had another game oh there you go yeah that sounds awesome what else did you do in the morning you did more Chimera um, yeah it was uh, two things at Chimera pretty much from uh, 9 to 10 we did the panel and then from 10 to 1 there was one session at Chimera mm-hmm. and then I had a one hour lunch and then from two to five was another session of Chimera. Oh, nice. Yeah. So yeah, I think we I think we went to lunch, and then I played from two to five. I played in Megan Dornbrock's uh, Thetis Worlds. Oh, nice. Podca- or, uh, podcast. Thetis World game. Yeah. Um, which was fantastic. I heard a lot of good things about it that. It was it was awesome. So it is a combination of Dungeon World and Norlandia. Yep. Um. With like, there's some tarot card mechanics mixed in there. Mm-hmm. Um, I, God bless Megan, yeah, uh, for putting up with us. <laughs> it was um, me, Jude, Steph, Aaron, and Amaras. Okay. Um. So, Jude, Steph, and Aaron have been friends forever, like through, since high school. Oh. They wow. all know each other. Wow. Um. I know them now through my friendship with Jude and like we spent most of Gen Con together and yeah. now I'll talk fairly frequently um, and then we know Aras from Discord and Twitter and all that kind of stuff so we're all like it's this whole group of people who know each other fairly well mm-hmm. sitting down to play this game that we know nothing about yeah um, only one of us knew anything really about Dragon Age mm-hmm. which is the world that you're playing in yeah um, it got very silly it was amazing <laughs> fun. Steph played this dwarf duelist yeah. um, whose whole shtick was that he would trap people in a net and then stab them. Oh. So he was known as the net guy. Well, that's very efficient. Uh, yeah, his name was Bradable Daggerhand. Um, <laughs> you can call him Brad. His nemesis was Tabitha Handy Pants. Um, he had taken Tabitha out for tapas. And Tabitha never called him back. What? It turned out later it was so, so tapas, and uh, they had to go Dutch, and Brad had also used a coupon. It was very wow. gauche. Wow. Um, <laughs> but there was a... <laughs> what is this game? <laughs> there was a, all of that had, like, nothing to do with the plot. No. <laughs> I learned later that uh, Tabitha is also responsible for inventing Caprice. Oh, my God. Um... <laughs> <laughs> oh God! Like, I love Steph. Steph is hilarious. Uh-huh. She's so much fun to play with. Yeah. Um, and her and Jude and Aaron and Brittany together, like it was fantastic. Uh, Jude obviously played a blood mage. Yeah. Um, like you do. Of course. Of course. <laughs> like you but expect anything he's less. Not a blood mage, but he'll play one. Like definitely not a blood mage. Yeah, definitely right? not. Definitely not. Hundred percent. Uh- <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> um, so that was, that was a lot of fun. And we had to, like, find a missing baby and solve this conspiracy. And, yeah, it was very good. Oh, it was very good. Nice. Um, you kind of draw tarot cards to sort of develop clues. The clues are based on, like, the suit and everything. Yeah. Um, and then the goal through the game is to kind of connect those clues and solve this mystery oh, that's nice. happening. Oh, nice. Nice. Um, and it was... That was just fantastic fun. It was it was such a good time. Um, Megan ran an absolutely amazing game, and like I said, bless her for putting up with us mm-hmm. in that game. But it was just so much fun. It was fantastic. Yeah, I uh, I saw that Victoria from the Broadswords. She was looking for players to guest star on the Broadswords, 
Um, so I suggested you. Yes. Um, and Megan said, having had Amelia as a player, I completely agree. Oh, thanks, yeah. Megan. So, uh, yeah, do it. If they ask you, uh, that would be amazing to hear you in that. Yeah, I did tell Victoria that, like, hopefully we can maybe schedule something. I'm not caught up on their show, but... Yeah. Um, no spoilers, but uh, maybe there's room, uh, Victoria, if you're hearing this, for a uh, possible blood mage to to join. I think... Uh, call uh, me. I do uh, blood magic. Yeah. Definitely not in real life. Definitely not in real life. 100% maybe. 100% not a blood mage. No. Yeah. But interested in playing one. Yeah. A- <laughs> allegedly not a blood mage. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, that was that was my Saturday afternoon, early evening. Nice. Um, after my game of Chimera, I went to sit at a table uh, ran by uh, Victoria Rogers, and she ran a game of D and D that uh, is called uh, the the game the module that she's writing. Yeah, is called Shipping on the Docks. I heard her talking about this in Slack, and yeah. It, it was amazing. Yeah. Um, I, I want to know how much you geeked out playing in Victoria's game. Um, well, I had already played with her once for International Podcast Month, yeah. so I was geeking out enough for that. Okay. And I had actually talked to Victoria multiple times um, uh, throughout the, the convention, mm-hmm. and so I was feeling fairly familiar uh-huh. uh, with her, and so it was... So like you, playing... like, managed to rein it in. So it was better yeah. than my James D'Amato interview. Yeah, a little bit. Okay. Yeah, so it was... It was uh, at this point in the convention, I was playing with friends, um, uh, Jen uh, Pixelscapes, and uh, her husband uh, were in the game as well, and I was also with Angela Craft. Okay. Um, and... Others. Uh, I think that's one thing I've noticed about a catacomb too is that like even though there were people that on like Friday I didn't know by the time I got into games with those people on Sunday it yeah. was like we were comfortable and like yeah. you at least seen them around. Exactly. Um, it's yeah, it's like a very I don't want to say like it's super small because it's not it's not terribly small but it's it's intimate I guess I would say. Yeah, exactly. And then um, oh, Victoria's husband Kevin was, okay. was also a player in the game. Um, so, basically, we played uh, just some adventurers that knew each other and were uh, a team. And we, I don't want to give too much of the plot away, but there was somebody who needed her help uh, building a boat and winning, or not winning, but not coming in last to for this race. Gotcha. So, it's a race and they have special mechanics for the boat building. They have special mechanics for the race. Mm-hmm. It's a lot of skill challenges. And uh, we did great. We may have gotten first place in the race because of two natural 20s off the bat and a natural 19. Nice. Uh, so three in a row. It was just no contest on our dinky little raft boat somehow. Mm-hmm. And paddling with a shovel and a sword. Like you do. Like you do. Uh, <laughs> and it, it was just fantastic. Um, and we, we helped uh, an, an NPC find love. Oh, Which was nice. I mean, that's, yeah. That's really what you want in every game, I exactly. think. Exactly. Um, that's been one of my favorite things about uh, the Spire game that I've been playing in is one of our... One of our characters were like, oh, he just became a death priest because he his last relationship didn't work and he's just gone through some stuff. Just gone through some yeah. stuff. As you do. Yeah. <laughs> but it was fantastic. I love that game. Uh, Victoria, uh, she ran it so well. And, uh, uh, I mean, there was no doubt. And uh, I would I would play that again in the heartbeat. Uh, yeah. And, uh, yeah. I wouldn't change a thing. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, and then after that, uh, you had some celebrating to do. Yeah, Saturday night I had my happy divorce party that I threw for myself. Uh huh. Um, about twenty of us went out to dinner. Yeah. And um, had spaghetti and cupcakes. You know, nice. like a traditional divorce celebration. Yeah. The traditional divorce dinner of spaghetti and cupcakes. Yeah. Can I say that those cupcakes were amazing? Thank you. Like they were... e- even though they were gluten free, like most. most okay. <laughs> <laughs> Not to bash gluten-free, but 
most gluten-free foods, from what I've uh, experienced, uh, for things that are not traditionally gluten-free, yeah, um, they're they're usually very dense yeah. and hard and dry. But these were like like fluffy and moist and oh, so good. Yeah, it's my. They were carrot cake. Yeah. Um, it is my absolute favorite cupcake recipe because it makes three dozen. Yeah. Um, and I really like carrot cake. Yeah, and but it was like carrot cake without the like hard carrot pieces in it, which. Yeah, I mean, because nobody likes biting into like a full baby carrot in their yeah. cupcake. No, I'm well, really particular about texture. I have weird like sensory issues, so I don't like chunky cakes and things. So I put all of it in a, a food processor before yeah. I put it into the cupcake. That's amazing. Um, but yeah, I had promised Dakota, my Shadow of the Cabal castmate, last year that I would make him carrot cake this year for his birthday. Yeah. Um, and it turns out over the past year, he's found out that he needs to be gluten-free. Yeah. And so I was going to try and, like, make a test batch and didn't have time. Okay. Um, but, but based off of, a, a like, a different kind of flour that a friend had recommended. Oh, yeah. Tried it out, and they, they came out surprisingly okay. Oh, so, great. Yeah. Yeah, no, I really loved it. Um, and I heard that the, the celebration was a lot of fun. Um, the celebration was amazing. So after we all had dinner, um, we went and hung out right outside where you were playing. Uh-huh. We um, heard you a little bit. Yeah, Tanner was really annoyed that all the theater kids were outside the door. Uh-huh. Um, but we sat down. We learned about uh, Jim McClure and his Christmas nuts. Yep. And we invented the absolute worst RPG game ever developed. I, and heard, I are, heard a little bit about this. Yeah, we are now in the process of writing that. I don't want to give too much away about that either. But that is underway, and yep. I'm very excited. As you should be. Yes. Yeah, and that um, celebration apparently went until like 5.30 the next morning. Uh-huh. People were still hanging out and doing stuff. Yes. Um, I did um, not stay up that late. I left my own party. Uh-huh. Because uh, I was tired. Yeah, that would make a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, during your celebration, yes, I had the the honor of being in probably one of the best games I have ever been in. I just want to be clear that if I had gotten into that game, I would have ditched my own party to play that game. I 100% agree. Um, I don't know if I want to tell you that she had an extra slot open. She told me that she had several people not show up. Yes. There were at least two. There should have been at least two more people. There was, I think, six people signed up for the game. And only four of us showed. Mm-hmm. Um, which, uh, the other two people, if you're listening... You missed out. You, oh my goodness, you missed out. Okay, so, Katrina Ostrander ran this dread variant mm-hmm. that took place in Rokugan. Mm-hmm. And I played the Shugenja... Shujenga. Shujenga. We'll get to that. Um, and then, um, I don't know last names of most of these people, but uh, that's okay. So, Aaron played, uh, he played the artisan. Okay. I think the person that was good at music or something. Oh, probably a Kakita, I would imagine. Yeah, I think it's the, the yeah. playbook started with an A, so yeah. whatever. Oh, Asahina. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then... Uh, Tanner played the warrior. Mm-hmm. Okay, so he was a warrior. He had a troubled past, uh, and uh, he he had a lot of feelings about war and combat, and openly weeped yeah. like after battles and stuff like that, mm-hmm. uh, and got made fun of. Because, yeah, which you are not allowed to do. Mm-hmm. You're, not, you're not allowed to show those kinds of emotions. We were part of the crab clan. Uh huh. Mm-hmm. And uh, then the the last individual, why can't I remember names right now? Uh, Quinn. Quinn, yes. So Quinn was there as well. He played the magistrate. Okay. Okay. So we had this uh, this motley crew. Um, I had brought an offering to the mountain god in the form of a potted plant, um, and I was going to give that to the mountain god because the mountain was producing earthquakes Mm -hmm. and it was doing rock slides and we're like we need to uh, calm this mountain god down. Hey settle down mountain god. Yeah seriously. Um, But we we basically went to this castle because the uh, the head of the castle he had done some open rebellion against our lord Mm -hmm. and we needed to get there to see if uh, 
his daughter was on our side or not. Um, he had fallen in battle, so uh, all sorts of things tied together. Uh, I know Tanner's character was carrying this guy's sword, yeah. and on the way there, the sword was whispering to him, like, to openly rebel and do all this, like, weird stuff. And a common sort of like, thing in that setting. Whispering yeah, swords. Yeah. It was, I mean, it, blood swords. Yeah, so there was all this, like, weird stuff that was, like, adding up. I don't want to give too much away because uh, the game's still in development and I'm sure it's going to be played again, and I don't want too many spoilers. Um, the big thing that I know is that Tanner was killed by ghost centipedes. Yes. So Tanner was killed by his greatest fear, which was centipedes and other little bug things. He sacrificed himself by knocking the tower over so that the three of us could escape. Uh, now, at this point in the adventure... I had twisted my ankle because Tanner was afraid while we were in the cave temple and a gust of wind blew all the torches out. Uh -huh. He wanted to get out of there fast without pulling something from the tower mm -hmm. in order to get out of there carefully. And of course my ankle was the one that got twisted because he was pulling me behind him because he was in charge of protecting right. me, the Shugenja. So... We get back to the castle, and the magistrate and the artisan, they're doing their own thing. They're trying to find this amulet that's supposed to help protect against evil spirits. And uh, we were they were supposed to gather some information about it or whatever. We never actually got to the amulet. Because you died? No. Uh, they heard that the captain of the guard knew where the amulet was, so they snuck off to find her. Oh. And they found her office. Uh, and, uh, there was just all this, uh, interesting stuff that happened. Eventually, that, then Tanner got eaten by Centipede uh, after we got into our room. Um, and we were trying to escape, uh, from the centipedes that were running in. After Tanner got eaten by centipedes, we had to rebuild the tower. Mm -hmm. And then Quinn, uh, bless you, Quinn, uh decided to take out the bottom two bricks along the sides. I heard that Quinn made some choices. He made some choices. He he was going hard in this game. You know what you did, Quinn. Yeah, you know what you did. <laughs> so <laughs> Quinn is one of our um, Shadow of the Cabal patron, patrons. <laughs> yeah. Quinn was amazing. Uh, Quinn is a wonderful person. Yeah, uh, and he played this character so well, and my character hated his character so much. Yeah. Like, just, just absolute spite. Uh, I, that she had to travel with this character. I heard that you said the F word. I did say the F word. While you were playing this game. This, okay. This game was intense. This game was so intense, and... Well, and it was like you guys were playing, like, in a dark room yep. with, like, the lights dimmed. The lights were dimmed. There was a, there was virtually a spotlight on the Jenga tower yeah. for the game, and that's about it. It like barely lit us all up as yeah, we were around the table. Tanner was saying that like everybody's like water bottles off the table, phones off the table, uh -huh. like nothing can touch this tower. Yeah. So Katrina ran an amazing horror. Game. Oh gosh, it was intense. I'm so jealous. Yeah. And at the end, um I probably did ten to fifteen straight pulls. Yeah, I heard you're really good at Jenga. I, I don't know where that came from. <laughs> like <laughs> adrenaline. Uh, at the beginning of the game I'm like basically trembling just pulling one brick out but after a certain point in the adventure I said to myself I don't mind if I die any point after this mm -hmm. as long as I can go out a little bit on my own terms and I just became fearless yeah I was just like all right you want me to get more information here I'll pull a brick you want me to get there a little bit more carefully I'll pull a brick um, and I'm limping through everything at this point. Yeah. Because my ankle's still busted. So I have two brick poles, basically, if I want to get anywhere. Oh, my gosh. And, oh, it was amazing. So I, I basically got to the last one where I had to piece together a spell on the fly based upon my experience and research trying to exercise demons. Yeah. And apply that to a living spirit. Oh, gosh. And I was able to do my... It was either two or three brick pulls yeah. to do this. Um, and to do it quickly because she was coming at me with a knife. Ugh. 
as Quinn's character was climbing down the wall to escape. And I did it. Nice. Uh, at, at every single junction, mm-hmm. I was like, should I knock over the tower to myself? Should I knock over the tower now? Yeah. Should I, should I do it? And I'm like, no, I think I want to try to live. Yeah. And I just kept going. And then, like a maniac, after all was said and done, Katrina gave me one more choice. If you want to know what was kind of going on here, you can pull one more brick and I'll tell you. And I did. And the tower came over? The tower did not fall. Oh my gosh. Yeah. It was it was a beautiful thing. Did she have that horrible smile on her face the whole time? Uh-huh. She gave me that smile yesterday and I was like, I know what this look is because I've interviewed her about her GMing style yep. before and I'm like, I know what this is and what you are about to do to me. Uh-huh. She was phenomenal. Yeah, she's like, a great GM. She's yeah. a great GM. This is going to be one of those games that I, I literally will not forget. Yeah. Um, last year, it was the Darcy and Troy 12-player cipher system, multi-table, uh, time-traveling romp. Yeah. That uh, was one of the most intense things I had played up until that point. Mm-hmm. And this trumped it a little bit. Wow. Uh, just because of the intimacy of yeah, the setting absolutely. and and the the beauty that is Dread. This was my first experience playing Dread. Yeah, I've never gotten to play Dread. I would love to play it. It's, um, ugh. Yeah, I know Tanner said that he was he would like to at some point like try and run us through a, a Dread game like yeah. similar to that. Mm-hmm. So I think that would be a lot of fun to try out. Yeah, it would be amazing. Uh, but yeah, uh, keep an eye out for it if you're if you're interested in. Uh, Dread, or if you're interested in Roke again, um, this thing is going to be something to play that yeah. uh, everybody will remember. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. That was that was the end of my Saturday. Oh my gosh. We yeah. still have a whole other day. That was a four-hour game. Yeah. And it was fantastic. We do have a whole other day, but I only had two games on Sunday. Um, yeah, so Sunday morning, I actually didn't have anything. I just hung out. Oh, that's not true. I didn't just hang out. Um, Sunday morning, I had, uh, like, last breakfast with a couple people before they had to head off. Yep. Um, and then I went downstairs to just see who was hanging out, and I ran into Jim and Emily, who were playing, uh, Forbidden Sky. Okay. And, um, with Rob Stiff, and they invited me. And I invited Katrina Ostrander nice. to come play with us. Um, and then James D'Amato sat down and provided color commentary for that game. Oh. Uh, we did not win. Yep. It's a collaborative game. Um, if you've played Forbidden Desert or Forbidden Island, it's like that, except in the sky. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's like laying out tiles and matching pieces, and you have oh, to like, nice. set stuff up. Um, and we, we died before we could complete the pattern that we needed to. Um, because of lightning strikes. Oh. Uh, the good news is we did not run out of rope and fall 7,000 feet. Oh, that's good. Uh, which the the rule book was very specific that you were 7,000 feet in the air. Oh, it wow. It said that a number of times. <laughs> exactly 7,000 feet. Exactly. Yeah. Mm. Uh, not 6,900, not 7,100, 7,000. Wow. So, uh, yeah, we didn't fall to our deaths, but we, we, we got struck by lightning. Because as we were picking our character types... Um, we apparently did not feel that we needed a medic. Oh. Um, and Katrina implied several times that she definitely did not push the medic off of the platform that we were working off of. So, like, I fully, <laughs> I fully believe her. Yeah, I mean, why yeah. would Katrina ever? Lie yeah, Katrina about would like never do anything like no, that. No, she would never be yeah. that that devious. No, of course not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that was my Saturday afternoon. And then I think. Um, we did that, and then what else did I do? Oh, um, we we took our flirt squad photo. Oh yes, um, which saw is very that. Important. Yeah, uh, yeah. Definitely look that up on Twitter if you haven't seen it because uh, it was an amazing. Photo. It's it's a sight to behold, and um, there are like lots of legs tangled up, and it's hard to tell who's or who's. And yeah, it, there's a lot happening. If you have a weak heart, uh, you might want to uh, you know brace yourself before you see it because uh, you might fall in love. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. Um, yeah, so that was my Saturday morning. That's awesome. 
was your Saturday morning? Uh, Sunday or morning. Sunday morning. Yeah. Sunday. We're on yeah. Sunday. Sunday morning, um, I had some stuff to take care of at the front desk, um, and I ran into Victoria Rogers, um, and, and then uh, Kristen came down and Tracy came down, and we all talked for a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I'm going to try to uh, run a play test of Chimera with them. Oh, okay. And uh, make it into kind of like a, uh, you know, fully soundscaped uh, episode. Oh, cool. I think that would be really fun. That sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah, so uh, we're going to try to do that sometime soon, uh, within the next uh, couple months, after awesome. things settle down and yeah. and everything, but uh, I think that'll be a lot of fun. And uh, they had left uh, on Sunday, mm -hmm. um, and I told them that I was staying still till Monday, and uh, I, th I think they might be doing that next year. Cool. So it'd be awesome to be able to hang out with them a little bit longer next year if we're able to go. Yeah, there are a couple of people I know that left yesterday, um, and and were kind of kind of iffy on whether they wanted to stay through Monday or not. I think it's it's really tough because stuff is definitely winding down on Sunday. Yeah, and you have that you start experiencing those like first little hints of con drop, and you're like, oh, I don't really want to go, and all my friends are mm -hmm. leaving, and um, but there's also part of you that's just like, okay, I want to be home now. Exactly. And, like, I want the time to recover and, and stuff like that. Yeah. So it's, it makes a lot of sense yeah, to, it's hard to, to decide. leave Sunday. But um, if we if we hadn't left on Sunday and not on Monday, uh, there's a few experiences that have happened that wouldn't have happened otherwise. Yeah. Uh, which was fantastic. Um, I got to play Sunday morning in a game with uh, John Arcadia. Okay. Uh, he ran a very alpha playtest of a game called Legendary Defenders. Okay. Um, I heard that the first playtest that they ran, you played as yourself, uh -huh. and you got magical powers, oh. like in the real world or something like that. Like okay. magic was coming back to the real world. In our game, we played in a sci-fi, uh, uh, space opera sort of world. Uh, where you could play as any alien that you wanted, or humans, or whatever. And we discovered giant, uh, like, Robotech-style mechs. Ooh. And we became the pilots of them. Cool. So, the, we were able to, uh, basically, we got shipped to this asteroid uh, as a punishment to oversee this project by this uh, doctor... Uh, who was convinced that there was something on this asteroid, but the the organization that we were a part of was like, eh, probably not, but we got to appease her because the funding passed and all that stuff, so send these delinquents yeah. to the asteroid. Um, so, basically, uh, what happened is we found something, we went down into this uh, alien place we found these mechs and then we fought another mech oh uh the game itself is uh it wasn't bad it oh. was uh it's very alpha mm -hmm. so it had a lot, a lot of rough spots yeah uh but it was uh it was pretty good awesome i enjoyed it uh i i saw a decent amount of potential with it cool uh the character creation was kind of unique and and uh, I think it would be something fun to cover uh, once once it gets into a more uh, playable state. Yeah. Uh, so I, I gave our information to John, and, and John, if you're listening, uh, it would be awesome to uh, to follow up on that at some point. Yeah, so, definitely. Uh, yeah, it's, it's something to keep an eye out for. Uh, uh, like I said, it's a super alpha, and I know exactly how that process goes with a super alpha game uh, that has potential, so... Uh, keep at it, John, and uh, hopefully uh, we can play it again next time. Yeah. Um, Saturday, or, oh my gosh, Sunday, what day <laughs> is today? This is, this is post-con Amelia. Um, Sunday afternoon, I got to play the game that I was looking forward to the whole weekend. Oh, yeah. Uh, which, oh my gosh, run by Katrina. Yes, I got to play L5R 5th Edition, yeah. run by L5R 5th Edition author Katrina Ostrander. Oh, I was so jealous walking by that table. Um, 
God bless Katrina. She knew exactly what I was going to do. Uh-huh. Um, she put out the, like, she, okay, first of all, made these, like, pl- PBTA-style playbook yeah. things for I the saw, characters. I saw your picture of it, and I was like, this is genius. It's Yeah, it's really good, because it felt like an amazing mix between having to spend the time building your own characters mm-hmm. and just being handed a character sheet that you aren't, like, emotionally invested in. Yeah. So it had, like, three choices for your um, clan and school, three choices for your family, a couple choices for, like what kind of character you wanted to play and then she had all the stats written in there already so that you could just pull them based on your like okay this is kind of like the feel that I'm going for yeah so I played a Soshi Illusionist Mm -hmm. which is the Scorpion Clan Shigenja yep um I definitely took uh Forbidden Knowledge Maho why I know and then I definitely took Shadowlands Taint why I know and then I took uh, Disturbing Countenance. This is so unlike you. I know. And then I also took, gosh, there was one other thing, like Subtle Observer, I think. Um, so I played this uh, gender ambiguous uh, Scorpion Shigenja who nice. wore a mask that looked like Raven's Wings. Oh, sweet. Um, and was just sort of this like looming, overall very disturbing presence to be nice. around. Uh, it was so much fun. Yeah. Um, it is, she ran Dark Tides, which is the adventure that comes in the GM's kit for the game. Oh, okay. Um, it was a lot of fun. I played with people who had not, I think one other person had played 5th edition before. There were a couple people who hadn't played L5R at all. Yeah. Um, so I think that that, it slowed things down a little bit. We definitely went over our time and I kind of felt like we were rushing at the end. Oh, okay. Um, because the game uses Fantasy Flight's narrative dice, um, and mm-hmm. because it mixes the old system's roll and keep mechanic. Yep. Um, it took people a little while to kind of get the, like, what do the symbols mean? What can I do with opportunities? Yep. Um, how do I decide which dice to keep? You know, what are what is strife? That kind of stuff. Yeah. Because um, it's, it's a little bit of a complicated mechanic. Yeah, a little bit of a learning curve on that Right, one. right. So it took a little time to, like, interpret some of that stuff. Um, yeah. We had, yeah, a couple of players who were... Um, I had a lot of questions about like the the setting and that kind of stuff because I think one of the one of the people had played like third edition L five R but had not played fourth or fifth edition oh, wow. yet, um, and so I think some of his knowledge was like a little bit. I was like, no, no, it's not like that this time, you know. Yeah. So like, there's a little bit of a learning curve there. That makes um, sense. So like, I wish. I think it would have been perfect if we had played it over two sessions instead of one. Mm-hmm. Um, that was my big thing, was it just felt kind of rushed and, like... Yeah. We took so long with the learning curve there that it didn't yep. get... We didn't get to really play the game. Yeah. Um, the adventure was really cool. I liked it. There were, like, a lot of clues and I think a lot of things to explore. Yep. So, like I said, it would have been better over two sessions because mm-hmm. I think that there were, like, we left a lot of loose ends and a lot of things that, like maybe wanted to like we got enough to be able to solve the the crime right but not enough to like I don't know I wanted to do more but and also it was a big group it was six people which is bigger than I like to have for L5R I feel Mm -hmm. like that game does best at max four yeah I think that's probably why the dread game worked so well yeah because we were at four people uh if if there were six people in that game uh I think it would have been a completely different experience yeah uh it would have been a little too crowded Mm mhm um, but yeah, it, it Rokugen is great at interparty conflicts, L five R. Yeah. And uh, seriously, the the interparty conflicts really shined with four people, and I can see it being a little bit unwieldy with more than that. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, because we didn't. Uh, it was a four hour game, mm-hmm. right? I don't think anybody died until the last hour. Yeah. I got really close to dying in this game. Yeah. Um, not so much in, like, not so much mechanically. Like, I was, I still had, like, three out of my four, whatever. Oh, right. Um, I forget what the endurance or whatever it goes against. Yeah. Um, but I know, like, I ran up to a guy and, like, hit him with my staff, um, and it didn't like didn't actually hit him and Katrina was like oh next turn is not looking good for you <laughs> and I I rolled and I did not roll any successes I rolled three opportunities and she said what do you want to do with the opportunities and I said Katrina 
I would like to die beautifully. <laughs> and she's like, well, okay, slow down. We're not there quite yet. Um, <laughs> but it was a lot of fun. It was, I mean, it was a lot of fun to experience that game um, with a different GM because I'm used to playing it with Tanner. Yeah. Um, and, like, Katrina's fantastic at it. She gave me that, like, evil, sinister look that she has, like, this mm -hmm. smile on her face that she just looks like she is so happy to be about to destroy you. Uh-huh. Um, and I loved it. I loved it. I get it was, that look so many times. Yeah, it's just, I like, she's, and because she's just, like, so sweet and quiet that, uh -huh. like, you're like, where is this coming from? Like, you do not look like a person who's about to, like, ruin my soul. Uh-huh. But I know that you are. Yep. And, <laughs> like, I mean, in the best possible way. Yep. That was, it was a lot of fun. Like, I had my, my nitpicks with it because it was, you know, uh, too many people and uh, not enough time. Yeah. But I think it was good overall. I really, I really enjoyed it. That's pretty cool. Yeah, and at that time, that was the one I was playing my second Descent into Midnight game. Yeah. Um, and which, uh, I think it was full on the sign up, but the last game slot of Sunday, there was like maybe three tables playing. Yeah, there's a lot of people who have like gone home or like I know. You know, I had friends who were, like, not planning to go home until Monday, and then, like, stuff came up, or they didn't really have anything scheduled, or, yeah. you know, like, whatever. So, for a variety of reasons, it starts to clear out on yeah. Sunday. Yeah, people start feeling it, and they, yeah. they just wanted to get home and get out of there, uh, which is totally understandable. Uh, but within the, the three-hour block uh, that we had, um, I think we were able to pull together a really, really good game, uh, sent to midnight, and... Uh, we, we solved a problem in a spectacularly horrible way. Cool. Yeah. I yeah. accidentally uh, exploded uh, magma that super cooled onto our homes. Oh. Um, but it stopped the, the crazy amount of ice from destroying our heat source. Yeah. Well, so whatever I, whatever works, right? Yeah, in our game, Jude tried to just feed it his own soul instead of, yeah. you know, so. As you do. Right. Like. <laughs> okay, yeah, just feeding things souls. Yep. Uh, it turned out that he played the exact same play playbook that I did in, a, in his L5R game. Oh. And picked the exact same disadvantages. Nice. And the exact same, like, feature descriptions. Like, that makes sense. Also, like, a gender-neutral, uh, disturbing countenance yeah. character. Y you two are fairly similar. Uh, yeah, it was, he, like, said, because at one point earlier on the weekend, I was complaining that we had actually never gotten to play L5R together, despite the fact that that's how we know each other is from yeah. that community. Um, and he sent me a message back and was like, we couldn't play together because we would just play the same character. That's true. So, yeah, that yeah, would be boring. It would be. Uh, no, I, I don't think it would be. I you're, think that we, right. would be, <laughs> we would be absolutely <laughs> that's true, awful. Because you, you'd be playing the same backstabbing, like, blood magic, like. We don't just, do blood magic. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Let's just say that both of you would be very naughty. <laughs> <laughs> yes, correct. All right. Sure. Um, and that was the last of the official stuff? Yeah. Sunday? Uh, yeah, what? Sunday night I went um, to record the wrap-up, our Catacon wrap-up with oh, yeah. Shadow of the Cabal. Nice. Um, that was a lot of fun. And then we went out to dinner and just, like, hung out and had friend time. Yeah, very cool. Um, yeah, right after the Descent into Midnight game, uh, we took a little bit of a break. Uh, but then afterwards, we met up with uh, Richard Creighton's Landry and Taylor and Meg and Amaraz. Mm -hmm. um, and we all went out and got some Thai food. Uh, and then we came back and played probably the most inappropriate game in existence. Uh, if was it a little bit naughty? I would say it was a very bit naughty. <laughs> um, <laughs> Oh God. Um, yeah, there were so good. There were words that were said, and 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 embarrassing moments may or may not have happened in public uh, as we played this in the hotel lobby. I may or may not have blurted something out that uh, may have been a little too loud, but you know, it was fun. Are you gonna tell people what this game is called? I don't remember the name of it actually. Devil's level. Devil's level? The Devil's Level. Oh yeah, The Devil's Level. Okay, so the point of the game is you've got three different um, levels, right? 
Um, one of them was depression, one of them was genius, and one of them was some H word that, you know, happens. Okay, so it, yeah, if you follow Taylor at all on Twitter, um, he, he tweeted out uh, what I had said there. Um, but to be fair, it was all his fault that that happened. So, you know, as you do. Um, and we also uh, figured out uh, that you may be able to sous vide mac and cheese leftovers. Sous vide. Sous Sous vide. Sous vide. Well, sous-vide. but that's, that's how it's spelled, but it's French. It's sous vide. Sous vide. Mm-hmm. Okay. Wow, fancy. Okay. So, uh, but sous-vide. it's, it's you, you cook it in boiling water, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the water in the hotel taps, um, if you turn it all the way to hot, mm-hmm. it is it, Very hot. it is hot. Um, so my theory was you could uh, put the leftover mac and cheese because there's no microwaves in the hotel rooms. Yeah, it's really weird. There were fridges but no microwaves. So like yeah. I had leftover mac and cheese and I had I couldn't do anything with couldn't it. Couldn't do anything with it. And when I tried to do something with it uh, uh, Monday morning... It was, the, the mac and cheese was frozen, so that was a point against my potential process to reheat this mac and cheese. Yeah, I mean, take that, Crown Plaza, Dayton. Why yeah. you have no microwaves? Yeah, and why do your refrigerators freeze my leftovers? Yeah. Ugh. Okay. I don't know, I put cheese in my fridge and it seemed to be okay. Well, that's because cheese is, like, solid. It's not going to freeze. Exactly. Yeah, but I feel like you would know. I guess. Okay, it's not important. It's not important. Okay, maybe my fridge was turned up a little too much. Maybe. I, I did not check the gauge. I apologize. Well, we regardless... apologize, Crown Plaza Dayton. This might not be your fault. Yeah, I apologize. Okay, so... I tried to sous vide... Sous vide? Sous vide. Sous vide my mac and cheese this morning just to see if I could. Uh-huh. The outsides did get a little melty. I was surprised. Um, well, not surprised, because Tanner doubted me entirely, and I said, you know, physics, thermodynamics, come on. Um, but since the mac and cheese was frozen to start, uh, it made the water a little too cool, and uh, then... you would have had to, because, well, yeah, because usually when you sous vide something, it, it yep. circulates the water, yep, which yep. you cannot do in your bathroom sink. No, exactly, and, uh, we couldn't constantly be running water, and we you didn't have... You could have been in the bathtub. We didn't have enough time... Gosh, man, there's stuff. so many factors to there's being able so to much. sous vide your macaroni. I know, in a hotel room. Who knew? <laughs> <laughs> so, with time, I think I could have done it, but it probably would have taken a couple hours. Uh-huh. And well, next year, we'll try it out. You know, maybe. 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 I don't think the I want to care. 2019, <laughs> sous vide mac and cheese. Yeah, hey, hey Michael, if you're listening, uh, sous vide mac and cheese. Might be a good theme for next year's Acaticon. Yeah, absolutely. Acaticon 7, sous vide mac and cheese. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think that that's... I don't think he's going to buy that. Uh, probably we, not. We should work on our hashtag branding. Yeah, we probably should. Uh, if you want to do it, hotel... Uh, uh, hashtag hotel sous vide. Yeah. Uh, it started this morning. So feel free to uh, pile onto that hashtag and... Uh, sous vide some mac and cheese in your hotel rooms and tell us how it goes. <laughs> yeah, let us know. Because I am extremely curious if this is possible. And uh, at Leviathan Files would love it so much if you would tag him in your hotel mac and cheese sous vide. Because, <laughs> he, yeah, just take your photos of sous vide mac and cheese and uh, please at me and especially Leviathan Files because he would be over the moon to see these photos. I'm gathering, I was not there, but I'm gathering that there's a level of sarcasm involved. What? No. <laughs> not even a little bit. I mean, it's Taylor, so like, I'm going to go ahead and encourage everybody to do it anyway. But Taylor's fantastic. He, he is uh, somebody that is a good sport. He is. And would never hold a grudge uh, to somebody that is asking to spam them with uh, mac and cheese sous vide. No, it's not mac and cheese that he wants sous vide. It's hot dish. Oh, hot, hot dish. dish. Oh, yes. Taylor has lots of feelings about hot dish. <laughs> okay, so if you really want to impress Taylor, sous vide some hot dish. <laughs> In your hotel bathroom. In a hotel bathroom. And <laughs> hashtag sous vide hot dish. <laughs> hashtag hotel sous vide. Hashtag, hashtag hot, hotel dish. hot dish. Hotel hot dish. Oh. That's it. Yes. Hashtag hotel hot dish. Yes. At Leviathan Files. Yeah. 
Uh, please include me in those tags because that would be remarkable. <laughs> uh, I don't know what happened, but I, I, I wish I knew. You know, this is what happens when you stay through Sunday. This is in, yeah, this is the Monday. kind of good stuff. We we came up with a couple of very good hashtags last night when we were recording. I think one of them it was hashtag Goop Year. Goop Year. Yeah. So we. <laughs> <laughs> because character uh, Tanner had a character that had like some kind of goop something going on, and yep. I was explaining Devin's character, which was made of goop, and so we decided that uh, 2018 is hashtag goop year. Goop year. And we would like it on a blimp, like good year, except goop year. You know, <laughs> like the, like the D is just turned upside down, like a P now. That makes sense. Hashtag goop year. Sure, I'll buy it. <laughs> <laughs> Look, it's uh, Monday after a con. We're a little a little loopy. Yeah, just a little bit. We've but, been in you know, a car for a few hours. Yeah, so we just wanted to give you the authentic uh, car ride home experience. <laughs> we want you to feel like you are with us driving through the very flat plains of Indiana. Exactly. So, uh... God, it is so flat here. It really is. It's, I don't know, it's kind of unsettling. It is a little bit. I mean, we're even seeing the blue, like, horizon of uh, whatever that uh, special effect is that was captured by famous painters back in the day. I think it was Leonardo. I don't know. I don't know. I learned about it in some art history course a while ago. Huh? Yeah. It's yeah. got a name and everything. I'm sure. I'm sure somebody has a name for it. So please add us if you know. I'm curious. Yeah, what's that blue thing? The, the blue <laughs> effect of the bluish horizon. Hashtag blue horizon. Yep. Uh, which uh, sounds like a thing. Yeah. So, yeah, thanks for joining us on this uh, very special bonus content of Character Creation Cast. Uh, we owe you an apology for uh, having to listen to that. A little bit of one, but uh, I have been one of your hosts, Ryan Bolter. I'm your other host, Amelia Antrim. And you can find us online at various places. Uh, that we that was the best plug ever. You can find <laughs> us online at various places. That reminds me of Alex's. Uh, you can <laughs> go on Twitter. That's, uh, you can go on twitter.com yep. and uh, <laughs> just find me on twitter.com. Exactly. <laughs> um, but yeah, if you don't know by now, uh, I'm Ryan Poulter. I'm at Lord Neptune on Twitter. I'm Amelia Antrim. I'm at Ginger Reckoning. And we are Character Creation Cast at Creation Cast on Twitter. Well, that's enough for us. Uh, so take care, everybody, and uh, go ahead and uh, create some amazing people. Bye. Bye. Character Creation Cast is a production of the One Shot Podcast Network and can be found online at www.charactercreationcast.com. Head to the website to get more information on our hosts and guests, or even some of our character sheets. Character Creation Cast can be found on Twitter at CreationCast. I'm one of your hosts, Ryan Bolter, and I can be found on Twitter at Lord Neptune. Our other host, Amelia Antrim, can be found on Twitter at Ginger Reckoning. Music for this episode is used with a Creative Commons license or with permission from the podcast they originated from. Further information can be found within the show notes. Our main theme music is Hero Remix by Steve Combs and is used with a Creative Commons license. This podcast is owned by us under Creative Commons. This episode was edited by Ryan Bolter. Further information for the game systems used in today's guests can also be found in the show notes. If you like the systems discussed and wish to purchase them, links to the products can be found in the show notes. Also, check the notes or the website for cool stuff to go with each character, such as dice or mixtapes. Thanks for joining us, and remember, we find that the best part of any role-playing game is character creation, so go out there and create some amazing people. We will see you next time. Some show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs.
Character Creation Cast is hosted by the One Shot Podcast Network. If you enjoyed our show, visit oneshotpodcast.com where you'll find other great shows like The Broadswords. The Broadswords is an all-woman D&D podcast focused on drama, roleplay, and subverting stereotypes. Join the broads as they unravel the mystery of Snowy Rashomon, a land ruled by witches and steeped in superstition. Berserkers reign and spirits roam the frozen wastes. Yelaris, Kila, Mipri all have their own reasons for journeying north, but they soon find they have something in common. They are pawns in a divine plot.